Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Science, Facts, and Fallacies, episode 216. My name is Cameron English. I'm your host, as always. Joined again by Dr. Liza Dunn, sitting in for uh, Dr. Kevin Folta, who's off, probably not sleeping at all and learning to be a dad. <laughs> Liza, welcome back. How are you? Thanks. It's so good to be here. How are you? I'm I'm good. I just had half a cup of ice cream, so I've lowered my diabetes risk. I'm feeling <laughs> I'm feeling good. Yeah, I'm going to have one after this, and I'm going to have a glass of wine too. <laughs> okay, there you go. So you're fighting your cancer risk. You're getting antioxidants. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. I forget all. I forget all the pretend health benefits of uh, drinking wine. I just drink it because I like it. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's jump into our stories. We've got three as always. And um, all the stories are important, but there's one in particular we're talking about that kind of makes my blood boil. So uh, we're going to spend a little bit more time on one of these than, than the other two. But let's get into it. So first up, farmers in the Philippines blocked from releasing GMO golden rice and eggplant by a 10-day Supreme Court ruling. Next, without glyphosate, critical wetlands and wildlife could be strangled by invasive plants. And finally, biofarming can help pioneer new treatments, but cumbersome outdated regulations block innovation. Okay, so this first story is the one we're going to spend not too much time on, but there's a little unpacking we have to do to discuss all the relevant details. But basically, this news story we're talking about, this is from the Philippine Star. It's by a journalist named Neil Cervellos, I want to say. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But in any case, the, the Supreme Court in the Philippines just ruled, <clears throat> at least temporarily, that golden rice cannot be released commercially. The farmers can't grow it and then sell it onto the market for, for consumption. Um, now, if you're not familiar with golden rice, you probably are if you're a listener of the show, but if you're not familiar with it, golden rice is uh, it's a couple of several varieties of rices that have been bred to produce boosted levels of beta carotene <clears throat> in the grain of the rice. Because rice typically in, in the leaves produces beta carotene, but we don't eat that part of the plant. So we only eat the grain. So the trick was getting it in the grain. So when there's boosted beta carotene, you eat it and then your body converts it to vitamin A. Now, in, in the West, in the US and Canada and these, these kind of places, vitamin A deficiency isn't really a problem because we have an abundance of food and we can get lots of vitamin A. But in places like the Philippines and Bangladesh and, and a handful of other countries, they subsist on rice and they have a deficiency of vitamin A because they don't have access to the same uh, foods that we have. So the idea here was to breed this crop and then give it to farmers for free and then allow them to produce it. And then whoever wants it can consume it. There's never been any force. No one's locked into a contract or any of these things that have been said by Greenpeace and so forth. We'll get into some of this later. Um, but in any case, vitamin A deficiency, it affects about 250 million people around the globe. And it's mostly kids in poor countries in Southeast Asia primarily. And this is a truly tragic condition. So if you go long enough without sufficient vitamin A, you can gradually lose your eyesight and go completely blind. You can have immune issues and eventually um, you die. It's, it's, it's really sad. And uh, it's, it's sometimes difficult to talk about, especially if you have kids and you have young kids. Um, it's ridiculous. But, but a couple of statistics here. So between 250,000 and 500,000 of these children who, who have vitamin A deficiency go blind every year. Um, and about half of them die within 12 months of losing their sight. And um, I'd, I'd highly recommend Ed Regis's book. It's called uh, GMO Superfood. He's a great science journalist, but he talks in that book about how these kids gradually lose their eyesight. So during the day, they can see and they can play and they can work and go to school, whatever. But as it gets darker, they can't see what's going on. Like for you and me at like seven o'clock, say, you can see it's dark outside, but you can see what's going on. These kids just have to sit at home and they can't do anything. So they have to be catered to from, you know, dusk until the next day, and they eventually go blind. So it's it's really, really tragic. This this court case um, was motivated by the, the idea that golden rice is some sort of an environmental threat. It's gonna, you know, pollute whatever, whatever. It's it's a silly idea. But this is the this is the baseline for the Supreme Court's decision. Apparently, there's a law in um or or an um 
there's a subsection of the Constitution in the Philippines, and it says that, um, uh, let me just read the quote. So it says, a legal remedy provided by the Constitution for the protection of the right of a balanced and healthy ecology in accord with the rhythm and harmony of nature. Those are just woo words. They don't mean anything, right? And we'll get into why that's that's not a significant objection. But I'll stop right there before I start start ranting. And Liza, what's your input on this? Yeah, my input is that this is a real tragedy, and it, it's it's terrible that um, a perfectly preventable cause of blindness and death um, could be available uh, to to these kids. If you could take um, a deploy enough healthcare workers to put one drop of vitamin A under kids' tongues every six months or so, you could prevent this. If you had a way of fortifying your food, you could prevent this. The problem is that the vast majority of the world subsists on three grasses, and those three grasses are rice, wheat, and corn. And while they're good because they fill you up, they don't necessarily have all the micronutrients you need. And so you wind up with nutrient deficiency and vitamin A deficiency is one of them. Vitamin A deficiency makes you very, very prone to get a devastating measles um, outbreaks too. And watching children get sick with measles and develop these necrotizing lesions that really are like flesh eating lesions that will eat off their faces and things like that. They're really devastating. And I'd like to point out that we in the West don't have um, children dying of these diseases while we are lobbying against children getting preventative treatment for these things. And that's golden rice is, is an example of how incredible technology could prevent um, really, really devastating illness. And I actually have a long um, thread about this on my Twitter handle, but I like to think about it this way. Um, imagine if there was a drug on the market that could prevent childhood blindness and was given away for free. And then some NGO thought it was a way for big pharma to sneak in and get a hold of the market. And so they went all the way up to the Supreme Court to block it. They've done that over the past 20 years. So now imagine how many kids go blind over a 20 year period and die because they don't have access um, or to, to these, these treatments. So there's a real world similar case with pharma, right? Um, and except for it's a better outcome than with golden rice, right? So river blindness is estimated to affect 22, or 220 million people around the world. And um, a lot of kids go blind and it's carried by the black fly, which uh, likes to be near fast moving water. And it transmits a worm, the larva of a worm that then multiplies in lymph nodes and gets into the eyes and causes an inflammatory reaction and makes kids go blind. Well, Merck has a treatment for that. And it's a preventative treatment. And interestingly enough, it is ivermectin, which is listed <laughs> as the, uh, an essential medicine on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. And they have committed to donate it until river blindness is cured. And it has been greeted with all sorts of fanfare. And it's been thought this is a wonderful thing. Well, golden rice has not enjoyed the same kind of um, gratitude. Golden rice has been uh, blocked by many NGOs who, once again, think that it's a way for uh, you know big ag to make a move on the market. And I'd like to point out that those children, the children of the people in those NGOs, are not at risk of going blind and are in fact not going blind. So once again, it's we in the West imposing our values. Um, on a susceptible population uh, without understanding the ramifications of what that means. Oh, this makes me so mad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, it makes my blood boil. So I've shared this story once on here, but I remember a couple of years ago, well, almost two years ago, my son was just starting to eat solids. It's like seven months old. So he's in his high chair. He's eating a little bit of chicken and some rice and he starts eating it. And he's like, yeah. And he like slams on his high chair just in excitement because he's really enjoying his food. And I just had a moment as a new dad. And I said, this is great, you know, just to see his reaction and to know that he's getting what he needs. And then in that moment, just because of all the stuff that I do with, with biotech and all the writing, 
I thought this kind of sucks because there's a lot of parents that can't do this, not because they don't want to, but because they literally don't have the food that they need to feed their kids. And it just, exactly. yeah, it just, it just hit me. And it, and it, it was, it was a hard thing, but that's why I like talking about this. It's why my wife and I support a local food bank. It's like, like hunger is a, it's, it kills people as we're, as, as we're discussing. So let's start knocking down this case that Greenpeace brought. Cause this is, this is, Pure absurdity, and and everything they said is either just wrong or it's a lie, and they they have to know at this point. So, the the first thing that and this comes from that Philippine Star article, they say that um, Syngenta owns the intellectual property on golden rice, and the, and the implication is is that as Liza said, there's this big biotech company, this big chemical company, and they're going to sneak in, and pretty soon you're hooked on their rice, and you know, right game set match. No, in reality, both Monsanto and Syngenta gave up their intellectual property to let this project go forward. So they helped develop it, and then they released the patents that they had on the technology that was used to add this trait to rice. Now, there is a license for golden rice, but all it says is it can only the trait can only be bred into publicly available rice varieties, and consumers can't be charged more than they would pay for plain old white rice that they get anyway. That's all it says. Oh, and it also says it can't be used for commercial purposes. So in other words, the license strictly forbids what Greenpeace and what some of these news articles are claiming. It's not allowed. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <clears throat> yes, and I actually met Adrian DeBach, who is one of the people who is involved in getting that licensing. And he is beside himself because that this is not a commercially, this is not a commercial interest. This this actually shows you how um, a company can actually develop something that is really impactful for the world, and it can it can be because it's got the financial wherewithal and and is able to manage the regulatory hur hurdles of getting these through, which a lot of other scientists aren't able to do because they don't have access to that funding. This can really really help make the world a better place. And um, I, I, he's he's very frustrated with the situation. Um, and having taken care of kids myself who've been very, very uh, at risk of malnutrition, Quashiorcor kids, uh, Marasmus kids, um, it is terrible that this is allowed to happen because of activism. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's absurd. And speaking of, speaking of Adrian Dubach, He's a, and if you don't know who he is, if you're if you're sort of on the outside, he's a biologist. He was with Syngenta for many years, but he was pivotal uh, pivotal in securing the release of the intellectual property from Syngenta and Monsanto. He got right. There's a lot of legwork involved, even when everybody's on board, and he he made that happen. He was he was key to that. So he wrote a a, a chapter for a book in 2019. It's called Golden Rice to Combat Vitamin A Deficiency for Public Health. I promise you this covers every possible question you could have about golden rice, every objection. And he, I promise you he's thought of it and he's he's explained it. So I'd highly recommend that everybody read this. It's a peer reviewed uh, uh, book chapter. It's very good stuff. But let's uh, let's keep going. <laughs> let's keep going here. So uh, th the news frequently quotes Greenpeace on this issue. I don't know why, but they treat Greenpeace like they're an authority instead of a plaintiff in the lawsuit, you know? Yeah. So they're one side. You can get the quote for that, but I don't know. Talk to Adrian. Talk to any one of the scientists who have worked on this over the right now. We're not going to talk to these people. We're going to talk to Greenpeace. So they have a communications representative, whatever her title is, but her name is Wilhelmina Pellegrino. And one of the things... <clears throat> She says, and this is a quote, she says, the involved companies and agencies have yet to show concrete evidence of any benefit these crops would bring to farmers and the Filipino people. That is just an outright and complete lie. And that's why I recommended Adrian's uh, book chapter, because one of the things he talks about is the extensive amount of research that has gone on. And it's like at every level of this project. So they have to show that they could safely transfer the genes. I believe it's from daffodil and from a species of bacteria. They had to show that they could do that safely. They had to show that the amount of protein encoded by those genes 
um, didn't cause allergies. They had to do what's called substantial equivalent studies where they compare golden rice to just regular rice, like the same variety of rice without the 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 um, the enhancement, the trait that that boosts the beta carotene. They had to do animal feeding studies. I mean, like every level, and then they had to do uh, trials to show that it didn't cause any kind of a risk to the environment. And 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 this has been multiplied all over the world. So the FDA has has reviewed and approved golden rice. We don't need it for the reasons we were talking about earlier. Canada reviewed it. Uh, Australia reviewed it, and I believe New Zealand also reviewed it as well. They're like their FDA, their their equivalent of FDA. And then of course Bangladesh and the Philippines are the countries that are actually going to utilize this, their regulators and scientists reviewed it. So <laughs> this has been studied to the nth degree and nobody has been able to provide any objection to this that has withstood the test of time. And it's such an unfortunate thing because why do we have regulatory agencies and why do we have go through all of this to make sure that we have an abundant safe food supply? If that work in those billions of dollars can get undermined by either litigation or legislation by people who aren't really actively involved in studying it. So it, it, it really undermines the, the ability for um, people to uh, do something for the greater good. Um, and when activists who are very um, anti-GMO uh, get involved with these discussions, emotions take over. They really play to people's emotions and people's fear. And unfortunately, that leaves people uh, with, with holding the bag. And if you, if you can imagine being a mom watching your kid go blind and knowing that there's something out there to prevent that from happening, and because of the fear in the West about this, um, th th that that is being imposed on other people. And because of also, it also has to do with the, the idea that somehow corporations are always uh, behaving badly um, and so cannot be trusted under any circumstances. That narrative and the fear narrative are actually harming the most vulnerable people in the world. Oh, and by the way, we need to point this out if I didn't say this already. The Philippines already grows genetically engineered corn, and Bangladesh already grows uh, brinjal or BT eggplant, insect-resistant <laughs> eggplant. So, and those are commercial products that are sold for profit. So, we're nothing is being like sneaked into these countries. Nobody's being duped. The farmers that grow those products, they go, "Hey, this is this is interesting. I don't have to use as much insecticide. I'm going to keep using this." <laughs> and I and I and I believe in the Philippines. They're considered, at least in that region of the world, they're considered somewhat of a biotech leader in that respect. So, again, the Greenpeace narrative, it's just wrong. It's just objectively false. Here's here's something else that I that I want to discuss. The same person, uh, Miss Pellegrina, interesting name. So she says, the GM crop developers have not consulted communities and indigenous people who could be affected by these crops. This is wrong for so many reasons. So, so first... The, the governments in these in these countries have funded much of the research that's been done. That is, the people that pay taxes in those countries are paying for this. The, the International Rice Research Institute, which is one of the main organizations or institutions pushing this project forward, is headquartered in Manila. Their staff scientists are from the Philippines, they're from Bangladesh, and a handful of, of African countries. So basically, you want the input of people who are experts and they understand the local agricultural conditions. And then here's this is one other quote from from Adrian, which directly addresses this. So he says in 2009, MBA students at the Asian Institute of Management conducted uh, qualitative attitudinal surveys of small farmers and consumers in four different representative locations in the Philippines. Neither the color, because golden rice is, has a little bit of golden hue to it. He says neither the color nor the way it was created was considered a block to trying golden rice. And th the biggest concerns people had was that it was expected to assist their family's health and was affordable. And those have both been met as we described. So again, Greenpeace is lying to everybody, right? Right there, this is not some colonialist project. That's that's garbage. It's just false. <laughs> and if anybody's being colonialist, it's that yes. Yes. Right? because they're imposing their values on people who would benefit from a innovation that would make their lives better. Yes. 
And, and if you think about it, that's just the color argument, right? Where does where where do you find saffron rice? <laughs> right? People actually go out of their way. It's a, almost a sign of luxury to have golden rice <laughs> at right. your meal. Because right. saffron is ex extraordinarily expensive. So color, it shouldn't even play into the argument. Yeah. I, and again, it, it doesn't. It, it has no subs, no substance. It doesn't affect the, the nutritional quality of the rice or the environmental risk or any of that. No. But, but the point is, is like, they absolutely did. Over 10 years ago, they went in there and they said, what do you think of this? Would you grow it? Oh, and one other thing, the the cultivars of rice that they bred this trade into are the ones that are already grown and already widely consumed. Now, why would you do that? Because you're trying to consider the values and preferences of the people that you're trying to help. That's so, okay. so Greenpeace, I have four letter words for you. We're going to keep this family friendly, but go, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> and the very last thing about that is scientists in their own countries doing great innovative work in, in biotechnology to improve the food security for their own countries are at, at, at academic institutions and things like that are being denied the uh, ability to make their science help their local populations. And that's just a travesty. That's just a travesty. Yeah, there's a, um, <clears throat> he's a writer for Genetic Literacy Project, but he is, uh, I think he's almost finished with his degree, but he's in Uganda and he writes about this all the time. And he says, you know, you're scared of these big biotech companies, but they don't usually develop the products that we grow because we don't grow a bunch of corn and we don't grow a bunch of soy. There's specific staple crops we grow and we have the expertise. We have scientists that have been trained and they're doing this for us. And there's companies in our countries that are doing this for us. So this is very much, you know, a handful of, of pseudo social justice activists who are harming people. People are dying because of this. So I and just, they can, the thing is, if you once again, I'll say this over and over again: agriculture is the foundation of civilization. Yeah. And if you can have a productive farm, your children aren't tied to the land mm -hmm. you as a woman are able to go get an education and you know ex do things that are not tying you to the land as a subsistence farmer and that gives you opportunities uh that are that 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 sort of lift you up right and that's what happened in the united states in 1900 45 percent of us farmed and we lived to the ripe old age of 45 in 2000 two percent of us farmed and that and now we're living close to 80 and that's because people were able to use really good tools to be able to get themselves off the farm and people who chose to farm were given the opportunity to farm the most efficient way um, and so I think that denying developing countries this this technology is really uh, chaining people to the land and they aren't going to do it. Uh, the, the hungry people aren't good stewards of their environment. All they care about is yes. eating. Yes. They will do everything they can to feed their children. So we need to rethink the uh, way we approach um, modern agriculture. There are not enough people who advocate for its uh, benefits. 100%. 100%. We don't have a clean environment because we have a big bureaucracy called the EPA. We have that and we have all the rules we have because we have lots of money and relatively lot, huge amounts of free time where we can think about these kind of secondary problems because our most of our kids are not going hungry and we're not dying of preventable diseases. So we can move on to stuff like air pollution and right. we can worry about... Yes. and romanticize subsistence farming, even though none of us could do it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's my challenge always to people who are, who, you know, go move to Bangladesh and go live the way you're telling them to live. And when you do that, okay. The, you know, right. Right. Then you're living it down. But until then, I just don't want to hear from you. <laughs> yep. All right. Let's move on before I start throwing things around my office and talk about. <laughs> actually, that's not. I'm probably going to do that anyway because we're talking about glyphosate again. Um, this is a story by uh, Susan Goldhaber. She is a, a toxicologist, much like our guest host, and um, she focuses on uh, environmental chemicals, particularly in water, is what she she writes about and does research on. But here she's talking about um, the use of glyphosate, which, as you've as you know, probably if you're a listener of the show, active ingredient in uh, 
and Roundup Weed Killers, and it's off patent now, so you can find it at a bunch of other bunch of other brands of uh, weed killers. But in any case, she's talking about the use of glyphosate to control invasive species of weeds that are threats to wildlife habitats, and in some cases, endangered species. Now, the problem is you have a lot of activist groups who they don't only say glyphosate causes cancer, which there is no evidence for the nth time on the show that it causes cancer. There's just not. We can talk about that if uh, if if we feel like it. But as we've talked about multiple not times, it. yeah, there's just there's just not. We'll talk about IARC in a second, another blood boiling institution. Um, but basically, <clears throat> there's lots of. Um, they're not municipal governments, but like local governments will use this, especially in Florida. It's a problem. You have these invasive weeds and it's a threat to the animals and the plants that are that are in these parts of the country. And so one of the great uh, environmental groups is Nature Conservancy because they've taken a very brave stance on this. And they've said, look, we understand some people, you know, some of our colleagues are concerned about glyphosate. But the reality is, in terms of ecology, this is a very, very valuable tool and we need to keep using it. And one of the reasons is that like in rural Florida, where you have you have some of these out of control weeds, it's it's miles from civilization. You can't just walk in there and start hacking weeds apart. Right. It's deep, deep yeah. in Florida. It's not practical. So you can go in there with with a backpack sprayer or you can go in there and treat it with glyphosate. And it's hugely important. But this, again, is just one of the negative consequences of this assault on glyphosate, right? So it's being pulled off of um, the consumer market because they're trying to prevent <laughs> prevent some of these, these lawsuits. Now, of course, it's still going to be available because, as I said, it's off patent. Lots of companies sell it. So, right, this is a charade invented by the lawyers, right? We're fighting for public health, but in reality, it's not going. It's just... It's silly, but again, this is one of the one of the consequences, right? Is like you're going to have to figure out how to manage these invasive species. So, and, can I tell yes, you about a couple of California invasive species that are that actually directly in public uh, directly impact urban communities? Uh oh. So this is this is so people people you, if they can't see it, they don't really think about it. But this is a big deal in California for a couple of reasons. So water rights. Are a huge deal in California. And California's water system supplies over 30 million people and five and a half million acres of farmland. And they require three, three million of those require um, require irrigation. So some of the stuff that impacts that is water reservoirs, right? If you don't have enough water in your reservoir, people are fighting over who gets to drink water and who gets to irrigate their crops so you can feed people, right? Well, if you have an invasive species of plant in your water re reservoir, that's a problem. And so what, what's in there? Well, water hyacinth is. And water hyacinth was introduced into the U.S. in 1884 and has become known as the fastest growing plant in the world. One plant the size of your hand can grow into a mat of vegetation covering 6,500 feet and six feet deep. And that chokes out local plant species and dis dis uh, decreases dissolved oxygen and nutrients in water. And it blocks the sunlight. You get anoxic dead zones and fish kills. And then it becomes a breeding ground for 80s mosquitoes, which carry Zika and West Nile and dengue. Dengue is a hemorrhagic fever like Ebola. And it's an that insect is an invasive species as well. And it's been found um, all over the United States now. The other, the, the other thing it does is it can transpire 400 cubic meters of water per hectare. And that causes water levels to dry up in these reservoirs. Now, it's a big, huge problem in Lake Victoria in Africa. It's choking out Lake Victoria as well. And so it transpires a lot. The other huge problem in California is Arundo Donox which can grow 25 feet in a year. And it's the giant reed. It looks a little like bamboo. It's also very thirsty and it can transpire 56,200 acre feet of water per year in the Santa Ana River. If Arundo were not drawing that much water from the river, it would be enough to serve a population of 190,000 at the cost of $12 million. That's the impact of this. Now, Arundo, also has this other kind of maybe unforeseeable problem. It loves to be kindling. 
for forest fires. And so what it can do is it bridges natural breaks because rivers are going to be natural breaks for jumping um, from, from fire, forest fires. And it acts like wonderful kindling for setting huge fire, forest fires in um, California. So these, these really have huge impacts on both urban and rural societies, and um, they need to be managed. Yeah, it's very, very important. And, and another thing, and this is just a side issue, but it's really frustrating. A lot of the activist groups who, who are opposed to glyphosate, they are also very, very adamant about how California regulates and distributes water. And they're very concerned, and this is so ironic to me, they're very concerned about um, releasing water for irrigation or for irrigation for agriculture and so forth, because you know there's the the West California guppy or like whatever whatever rare fish species or some kind of algae. Like they're freaked out about losing all of these supposedly endangered species. And I, I get that on one level, but frankly, I need water. Right? Kids need water. We need to grow food. I care about water for public health, clean drinking water for public health more than I do some some fish or whatever. But even and once the, again, you yeah. are thirsty or you are hungry, you yeah. are you're going to be eating those guppies. Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's go spear fish and let's do it. That's um, exactly right. Yes, it's it's enormously important. But then, but just on their own terms, these same groups are allowing some of these invasive species to grow that can be controlled with 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 pesticides because they don't like who makes the pesticides because this is more about fighting corporations and fighting capitalism than it is about protecting the environment. And it actually costs people so much money. So yeah. um, the town of Windsor in 2018 did a, a study looking at in, in California, looking at how much it would cost to convert all of these acres to hand weeding, right? So this little town, right? Quote, to convert all bedding areas to hand weeding with no chemical use would increase the current annual cost from $33,000 to approximately $280,000 for weed control. Hand pulling weeds will require an increase in contract labor, which is a current staffing challenge. Mm -hmm. This has been known to increase workers' com compensation rights because of constant bending, twisting, and stooping to remove the weeds. So we don't have the labor. So the weeds grow out of control. They take they take over water supplies and they cause fire, forest fires. The <laughs> other option is you could use a very inexpensive, off patent, virtually non toxic chemical if you're a person, um, <laughs> and and if you're not a plant or or a microbiome, a, a little some microbiome, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, 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 you could use that and protect public health from wildfires and water and invasive species of plants and insects. It's, it, and it, it, it's mind boggling that we're even having this discussion. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pure foolishness. Let's briefly say something about IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. As we've said a bunch of times, they did what's called a hazard assessment, which is which just means they found some evidence that at some dose, at some exposure, glyphosate, hypothetically, if you forget to carry one and you only look at the studies that that meet the conclusion you want, could potentially be a carcinogen. Now, the problem was, and this has been criticized, this this very few people take this review seriously unless they're lawyers or activist groups. And one of the reasons is. They looked at animal studies and they found studies where rodents got tumors. And then there were other studies, I forget which sex it was, but it was either the, the male rodents got tumors or the female ro rodents got tumors. I forget which one. But they looked at the ones where the animals got sick and they said, oh, this is what we need. Let's just, <laughs> we don't need these other ones, right? And they just, if you read the report, they kind of say something like, you know, well, we looked at these rodent studies and these other ones were, weren't really relevant, <laughs> you know? They changed the conclusion of the studies yes. that they reviewed. Yes. They, they they said the studies said that they weren't carcinogenic mm -hmm. and they decided for some reason that they were, um, even though it wasn't true. Um, and that, that's, that caused a problem. The other thing that caused a problem, so it, it's not a carcinogen. And this has been replicated over and over and over again, most recently in Europe, where four countries, I would like to point out that they are not fans of Monsanto, these countries, <laughs> uh, four countries 
uh, reviewed 11,000, uh, 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 11, no, maybe yeah. they wrote an 11,000 page document. They either reviewed or wrote an 11,000 page yeah. document. It's like and, a life and, estate assessment group, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. And they, they, they um, looked at all of the studies that IARC looked at and looked at all of the studies that are out there in the regulatory world. Um, our studies are actually online. You can look at our studies yourself, right? And we're one of six registrants to evaluate as part of our transparency project. Come look and see. It is not a carcinogen. Now, the problem that really sort of came out of that is that IARC is a non-regulatory agency. It is an agency, a small agency within the World Health Organization. There are other agencies in the World Health Organization that, that evaluate pesticide residues. And they found that there was no evidence that glyphosate was a carcinogen. And now you've got two agencies in the World Health Organization saying separate different things. And that posed a problem. Uh, so the World Health Organization decided, because of these discrepancies confusing people, um, that that they were going to separate those those uh, regulatory process or not regulatory those 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 um, processes. So really, IARC is not supposed to be second guessing JMPR, where which are, was the group that analyzes pesticide residues in feed and food. Yes, here's a here's a quote from uh, it's called the Assessment Group on Glyphosate, which is the 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 study that Liza was just talking to. So they said, and they looked at like any aspect of to toxicity for glyphosate. It was eleven thousand pages, as you just mentioned. But speaking of of uh, cancer, they said taking all the evidence into account, i.e., animal experience uh, experiments, epidemiological studies, and statistical analyses. The AGG does not consider the criteria for classification with respect to carcinogenicity. The AGG or AGG proposes that a classification of glyphosate with regard to carcinogenicity is not justified. Okay, so it's like I, I don't know how many times or how many experts have to say this, and people keep pointing to IARC, which, by the way, the scientist who organized this uh, monograph meeting is not an expert on glyphosate. This is not his expertise. And the minute the report was published, he was hired as a litigation consultant by the major law firm that organized the class action lawsuits here in California against Bayer. <laughs> just, I mean, just reverse it. Just reverse it. Imagine if this was done by a private company and they were trying to rig the process like this. You'd never hear the end of it, right? Slate and the AP and everybody. They would just go on and on about the corruption of science, right? Right. The Intercept would have an eighty thousand word investigation. It's, it's just. And the frustrating thing is, once again, agriculture is a foundation of civilization. Right. Glyphosate is the foundation of agriculture worldwide. You take out glyphosate, you take out worldwide agriculture. We know how, what an impact taking out Ukraine by itself is, yeah. but this is it is. By far and away, the most important chemical, I think, on the planet, and and it is the most studied plant uh, chemical on the planet. It is the cornerstone of agriculture, and pe people who've banned it in the past. So Sri Lanka in 2015, there were allegations of some kidney disorder that were not based in any kind of real scientific um, uh, studies. Um, but because of that, they, they pulled uh, glyphosate, they banned it. And Sri Lanka's major export is tea. And so tea grows on a, on a tree. And so if a tree dies, um, you have to then spend all the time regrowing that tree, right? So that those exports pay for 71% of their food imports, right? And so, so, the, what Sri Lanka? It's a tropical island. The jungle started growing into the tea plantations. Young Tamil women were hand weeding the jungle. And what's in the jungle? Snakes. And not wussy snakes like we have in the United States, copperheads and rattlesnakes and things like that. No, these are cobras and crates. And the World Health Organization said that that snake bite was one of the leading neglected causes of morbidity and mortality worldwide in 2017. And who does it affect? It affects agricultural workers. So 
I would invite anybody who'd like to go hand weed the jungle to give it a try and see what they think. I think they'd find that glyphosate was pretty helpful. Anyway, it it had such a negative impact on Sri Lanka that they actually reinstated um, the use of glyphosate. Shortly thereafter, however, due to lobbying by um, activists, uh, Sri Lanka tragically decided to ban all agrochemicals, including fertilizer, and the whole country collapsed. And you saw the overrunning of the presidential palace by the population. Um, And this is a middle income, sophisticated, well-educated country. This is, they've achieved an incredible amount and it all went up in smoke when they adopted bad agricultural policies. Yeah. Yeah, long long and short of it is Vandana Shiva is not to be listened to on anything. She's crazy, she's wrong, and people people suffer when governments listen to her. And in fact, <clears throat> there's a story in Foreign Affairs recently, a couple of, maybe a year ago, they pointed out that that the country had actually lifted lifted itself out of poverty. It was considered a middle income country. That's how much progress they had made. And then they destroyed their agriculture sector. They ignored the input of their own scientists. Again, with this colonialism silliness, they ignored their own scientists and they listened to dumb people from the West. And, and there was a lot of suffering. The president was ousted. People jumped over, hit the fence of his palace and they started swimming. And they said, we're not leaving until this is fixed. Okay, so like, I don't, I don't know what else you need. This is bad. This is so bad, <laughs> you know. Uh, invasive species are the least of your worries. Um, one final thing before we move on, this is from Jeffrey Cabot, cancer epidemiologist. He's been on the show a couple of times. He pointed out in an article in 2018 for Genetic Literacy Project that glyphosate has been so thoroughly studied and so widely used over the last four decades, they've run out of ways to study it. Like, like there's no study design that you could do that would tell you something new about this chemical. It just, there's nothing else to do. <laughs> so... Yeah, there isn't. It's it's yeah, it's it's very well understood. Yeah. Yeah. OK, we'll leave that there. Otherwise, I'm going to I'm just going to keep ranting. I'm turning into my father. I'm turning into a grouchy old man. <laughs> okay. All right. Final story for the day. We're talking about uh, biofarming. This is an article. It was originally in published by the Cato Institute, reprinted by Genetic Literacy Project. It's called Biofarming can help pioneer new treatments, but cumbersome, outdated regulations, block innovation. Uh, authored by two of my favorite people in this in this field, Dr. Henry Miller and Dr. Uh, Kathleen Heffron. They're both great science communicators, and they're good at bringing this technical stuff down to a level where normal people like me can understand it. I really appreciate that. But here they're talking about biofarming, which is basically the practice of growing uh, active ingredients for drugs in plants instead of instead of synthesizing them in the laboratory and then uh, manufacturing them in mass, uh, you grow them in plants. And this has been been pretty effective over the years. Aspirin, for example, is an example of actually getting the active ingredient from nature. So that came from willow bark. Um, statins are another example. Uh, there's a COVID vaccine we'll talk about in a minute that was produced um, produced through through plant biotechnology. Um, and so- my favorite is digitalis. Do you know this story? Uh, I think you should tell it. You know it better. This is a great story. So um, William Withering was a physician in the 1700s. And if you had heart failure in the 1700s, it was called dropsy and you were dead within six weeks of diagnosis. There was no treatment, no cure or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So he had a patient with dropsy. And he said, unfortunately, I have to break it to you. You're going to die of this. And six weeks later, saw that patient walking around on the street and said, wait, what? how are you doing that? And he said, oh, I met a gypsy and she had a potion and she gave me this potion and I feel much better. (laughs) And so William Weathering was like, oh my goodness. And he went and he got this gypsy and got the potion and took out each ingredient and figured out that digitalis from the foxglove was the thing that was helping and now we know the mechanism. We've actually made medication out of it, and it actually increases the contractility of your floppy heart muscle when when you um, have heart failure. And so he wrote the first case series on um, 
an account of the foxglove is what it's called. And that's how we discovered digitalis, which we still use today. So many of our many of our pharmaceuticals come from Mother Nature mm -hmm. um, and we tweak them. And this would be a really interesting way of producing lots of really good drugs cheaply. Yes. Yeah. And there's all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, just before we get into plants, Kevin and I talked about this a while ago. There's bio uh, pharmaceutical companies. They are they go out and they collect these random poisonous animals like like scorpions, for example, or there's a there's a, a poisonous slug. It injects insulin or some like some kind of an insulin insulin mimic mimicker or something into its prey. It knocks its blood sugar down it and passes out. <laughs> and then it eats the it eats its prey. So there's companies trying to exploit this to make more effective diabetes drugs. And this is we going the Gila monster. Yeah. It made a drug called Bayetta that they that they used to do that. We use some of our antihypertensive medicines come from snake snake venom. Yes, yeah. So we use all of these things. If you if you got a, a chemical with a potential to a natural chemical that has a physiologic effect, you can use that to make people healthier. Yes, yeah. So the basic idea here it's one we've been using for. I mean, science. Global, globally, right? The idea is you can take uh, the, the the gene of interest, you can put it in another organism and mass produce it. So we do that with insulin. We've been doing that since 1982. Um, the hepatitis B vaccine is another example where they put the, the gene that produces the relevant protein into baker's yeast and it produces the active ingredient. Um, more recently, and this is a great example of what they're talking about, there's a Canadian company called Medicago which produced a COVID-19 vaccine. They had a candidate vaccine ready within a month, within a month of, of getting access to the, the viral genome. So Isn't that incredible? It's, it's crazy. And for reasons we'll get into in a minute, it still has not been authorized anywhere in the world, but they were able to synthesize the relevant um, DNA from the virus and then put it into a bacteria that infects plants really well infect the plants with it. They use tobacco plants. And then they mass produce what are called uh, virus-like particles. And then these are the antigens that you purify and you put into a vaccine. And it was a two-dose vaccine series, much like the, the other COVID shots we had. Um, and it was rejected, as many of these drugs are, or they're never brought to market for stupid regulations. So in this case, the World Health Organization said, we're not going to license this vaccine for COVAX, which is this international organization that distributes free vaccine to, to basically to poor countries that can't afford it. We're not gonna license this vaccine because one of your investors is Philip Morris. So it's, <laughs> it's another, this is another thing that drives me wild is just anyways. So the basic idea was the World Health Organization has this very, very strict policy of not working with tobacco companies or doing anything that could even be perceived of hypothetically promoting tobacco use, even if it means using a very common research plant, which is there's there's a variety of tobacco. It's great for transforming because if you want to see if you can engineer something into a plant, this is a great model plant to do it with. And this is what Medicago did is they grew the active ingredient in plants, in tobacco plants. So the WHO said, well, you know, you work with a tobacco company, we can't authorize this. And it's just dumb. Now, it'd be one thing if Philip Morris was like trying to sneak packs of Marlboro into packages, right, of the vaccine. They're like, hey, you know, it's stressful, right? Obviously, that would be a conflict of interest. But the fact that they were investing in a biotech company means nothing. It, it, well, it's, it's, they also have, uh, they also support multiple health systems around the country with all these back of taxes. So they yeah. are regulatory agencies and, and hospitals and all sorts of people are making money off of tobacco. Yeah. So it's that, you know, if it's, if it's okay for um, subsidies from tobacco industry to be supporting health, why is this any different than that? It's not, <laughs> it's not, it's dumb. And I remember when I, I, when I first wrote about this back in uh, last March, the, they had an, an uh, some woman from the world health organization. She said, well, you know, sorry, our policy is this, it's the policy. And it's like, when I call Comcast and I'm like, fix my internet. And they're like, nah, see policy. And I was like, well, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about your policy. And it's the same thing here, right? And, and you got to remember at the time, uh, and it probably still is the case, but at the time that this news came out, there was still a shortage of COVID vaccines, 
right? There's a, and it was it was at the point where the World Health Organization was telling the U.S. and Canada and these other developed countries, don't vaccinate your kids. Take your extra doses, send them to sub-Saharan Africa, send them to these countries because at the time, it's like 40% of the world had not even had so much as a single dose of a COVID vaccine. And so, we talk about equality of access, right? And, yeah. and you know, there was a whole discussion about, you know, companies not sharing IP and, and you know, hoarding vaccines and things like that. And people who are at risk not have, being a, a reservoir for worsening and mutations and things like that, right? So we, if the goal was to really truly help the majority of people, this is a big deal. Yeah, yeah, and it's just the the hypocrisy of it. It just drives me nuts because um, I know for a fact the WHO endorses the use of nicotine replacement therapies, and interestingly, several of these are made by companies that are owned at least in part by tobacco companies. All right. Now you can just dis- kind of double whammy of GMO. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Back, we're hitting, we're which hitting. Is just, yeah, which is just so unfortunate. And a lot and the fact that medical people are anti-GMO when their whole research platform depends on it. Yeah. Most of the mice that you and rats that you do work on are genetically modified. They're, you know, transgenic mice. Yes. Transgenic rats. And for some reason, you're not afraid of those rodents all getting out and causing wreaking right. havoc on the, the world. But they, they, they use the very technology that they complain about in agriculture. Yeah, that's right. A lot of, a lot of mice are inbred and genetically modified, so they're prone to uh, develop cancer or develop heart disease because you're trying to test new drugs on them, right? So you have to you have to genetically engineer, <laughs> engineer these mice. Uh, it's hilarious. Another concern- and I've never seen a plague of mice. No. But what about a plague that, that were taking all over Australia? There were videos of it all over the internet for a while, but yeah. mice kind of reproduce kind of quickly. And so if you, we know that this is not a problem in mice. We know that it's not gonna, they're not gonna do that, right? Yeah. In terms of a genetically modified mouse taking over. but. The, the the paranoia around doing it in crops when people are you know doing it with their own research is kind of amazing. Yeah, yeah, it makes no sense. Um, let's see. Oh, and like the the concern about gene flow. So it's not just animals, but in plants, right? The idea is you're going to get some pollen. It's going to it's going to float off from from where it's grown, and it's going to infect some other crop. And pretty soon, you're going to have insulin in your corn or you know some stupid thing like this. So a couple of things to say. I'm sure you have things to add. One one thing that's important is that these crops require special growing conditions. You know, like I grow blueberries in my backyard, but they have to go in pots because the soil isn't acidic enough to support the blueberries. And it's the same thing with some of these crops where you're growing, you know, highly specialized pharmaceutical drugs, right? You can't just like have pollen float off and then it's just going to grow anywhere, right? It takes, it takes special conditions. You have to fertilize it and so forth, right? It, it's... All that to say, things don't just escape, and then all of a sudden the food supply has some some very dangerous drug in it. Yeah, and that's also regulated. I mean, I think I think if I remember correctly, corn crops you can you can grow GMO corn next to um, organic corn, and so and sometimes farmers grow both. At the, you know, right? Yeah. But they have distance between each other, so to prevent, I think it's like six hundred and sixty feet or meters. I don't know. It's not meters, but 660 feet, I think is what it is. Um, so and that actually mitigates that there are all sorts of regulations about how to mitigate things like, um, pollen drift and, 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 and they're very well observed. Yeah. And I, and I believe, so like with pesticidal crops, for example, the EPA is heavily involved because they have regulatory authority over pesticides, including plants that produce ingredients or, or, you know, hormones or chemicals that are pesticides. I think in this case, you have the FDA involved as well, you know, and it's, it's regulated to the point now where you companies will not even start these projects because it costs hundreds of millions, probably billions in some cases, and they're just not going to risk developing something, however promising it might be. If there's someone in, uh, you know, Silver Springs, Maryland in a cubicle, who's going to go, no, 
Right. That's I don't. Right. Yeah. And if you want to bring it back to the environmentally friendly thing, these are this is using solar energy yeah. and absorbing carbon dioxide and is not using fossil fuels to build, you know, big buildings and things like that. So you have you've got a, a field, an oxygen producing field that is manufacturing your medication that is solar powered it, it, as opposed to having, you know, bricks and mortar and, and, uh, and you know, electricity dependent um, processes. Yeah. yeah. So it could be a very environmentally friendly way to um, really mix agriculture and pharmacology. Um, it, it's it's really interesting. It's a big deal, and and there's so many other 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 benefits. Like, of course, you just mentioned energy use, but um, there's risk of contamination when you're when you're growing things in a laboratory setting. That's not a problem with plants because plants aren't in typically, and and maybe you know different, but in most cases. The, the the bacteria and the viruses and stuff that infect humans don't infect plants, right? So this eliminates a huge aspect of the development process and cuts costs. It's just, I think it's probably just newness. And I get that new stuff freaks me out too sometimes. But, but in this, I, I, it's like, you know, do you want cheaper medicine that works? Because I do. I, <laughs> and I, perfect example of One Health, right? One Health, everybody's talking about that in regulatory circles and medical circles and veterinary circles. It's the balance between human, animal, and um, ecologic health in terms of the environment. And biodiversity is really the, the, the thing that people are trying to preserve. They're trying to do that by limiting greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuel use and things like that. And this falls right into that wheelhouse um, and is a very interesting and exciting way um, to um, think about novel technologies that could benefit a lot of a lot of the world. Yes, I, I, I sometimes like we talk about these issues and it's the same story more or less over and over. It's like there's this technology, we know how to use it. <laughs> it works really well. Here's the real downsides we know about. Um, but you can't use it because, right? There's, you know, because of politics, and it's always the, it's always the same. But uh, thank God we didn't have this much regulation when somebody first, when when electricity got started. I mean, people were very hyped up about it and worried about it. But oh my gosh, right? Can you imagine? <laughs> I try. I, I've Kevin. And I have talked about this. I heard this on another podcast I listened to. But imagine explaining to someone in like 1750. Uh, how we pump uh, gas into our homes and into our apartments, right? <laughs> you know, so like, right. So there's going to be this giant apartment building, and we're going to run flammable gas all the way through this building, and you're going to use it to cook your food and heat your water. You know what I mean? Like that would, they'd be like, "What? You're going to pump flammable gas into your house?" <laughs> you know? So like and now they're like, "Oh my gosh, beta carotene and rice." Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, it tells you. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, you know, sometimes we have good news with new treatments and stuff this week. It's mostly like, you know, people, people stifling progress, but you know, hopefully, hopefully things will improve over time. Um, let's, let's land the plane for this week. Thank you as always for joining us. And thank you, Liza, for joining me again. Um, she's going to be back for the next several weeks while Kevin's off uh, doing dad stuff. Um, so follow us both on Twitter. Uh, Liza is just at Dr. Liza MD on Twitter. Very active. She'll answer your questions. And uh, it, yeah, it's good. It's good. You'll learn lots of stuff. Like she's got the, she's got the thread right now about golden rice and I'm on there as well at Cam J English follow genetic literacy. They are at genetic literacy project, excuse me. They are called the genetic literacy project. They are at genetic literacy on Twitter. And with that, we'll be back next week with two seventeen. See you then. Thanks for having us.